Hello everyone. Welcome to the 1970 British Cohort Study introductory webinar. I'm Ryan Bradshaw, the Communications Officer for the Centre for Longitudinal Studies. I've just got a few pieces of housekeeping and then I'll hand, hand over to the presenters. Can everyone hear me okay? If you could put a thumb up or just, if you can't hear me, please just let me know in the chat pane in the bottom left. Great. If you have any problems, just let, let us know. Um, so first of all, um, we're going to stop microphones from working. So it's just going to be myself and the presenters who will be talking using the microphones. Um, but you will have a chance to ask questions. If you could just ask questions in the chat pane in the bottom left-hand corner, um, you'll be able you'll, you'll receive answers to those questions um, after each talk and at the end of the whole session. Um, so I think I can hand you over now to our first speaker, which is Matt Brown. Hello, and uh, as, as Ryan said, welcome to the um, British Cohort Study Introductory Webinar. I'm Matt Brown. I'm the uh, Survey Manager for BCS 70 here at CLS. And uh, I'm going to, uh, just in a moment, um, start the webinar by giving you an introduction to BCS 70. I'm then going to pass over to my colleague Brian, Brian Dodgen, who is a research fellow here at CLS. And Brian's going to tell you about how to actually access the data from BCS 70 and to tell you about the documentation which is available to help you make use of the data. We'll then uh, pass over to Tarek Mustafa, who is a research officer here at CLS. And Tarek is going to talk to you about the BCS 70 sample and about matters of non-response and attrition. And then at the end of the session, um, Brian and I will come back to tell you about what's new and upcoming with BCS 70. And then at the end, there'll be an opportunity to ask any questions uh, that we've not covered. And there'll also, as Ryan said, be um, opportunities to ask questions as we go through. So if you can just put those into the uh, chat pane, and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, at the end of each talk, and any any questions which we don't manage to answer today, um, we'll send we'll send written responses uh, to you um, after the webinar. Okay, so um, I'm going to start, as I said, by giving you an introduction to BCS 70. So BCS 70 is housed here at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies. Um, the Centre for Longitudinal Studies is based at the UCL Institute of Education and we're based within the Department of Social Science. We're responsible for the conservation, development and dissemination of three British cohort studies. So that's the 1958 birth cohort, otherwise known as the National Child Development Study, the 1970 cohort that we're talking about today and the Millennium Cohort Study. And we've also uh, more recently become responsible for the Next Step study, which is formerly known as the Longitudinal Study of Young People in England. Um, we are funded as a resource centre by the ESRC and have been since 2004. And our most recent funding covers the next five years, so the period between 2015 to uh, 2020. So just to give a bit of context, Britain is really unique in its tradition of birth cohort study. So many countries now have similar studies, um, but no other country has studies that go, far as, go as far back as Britain does. And BCS 70 is one of five uh, British birth cohort studies, um, and CLS, as I just mentioned, is responsible for three of them. Um, so the earliest cohort that began in Britain was the National Survey of Health and Development, which is a, a smaller study also run at UCL, uh, which began back in 1946. Then there was the 1958 and the 1970 cohorts. So note that there are 12 year intervals between those first three studies. Then there was like um, a really quite considerable gap between 1970 and when the Millennium Cohort study began in 2000. And then much more recently, um, the LIFE study has, has recently begun, which is also based at UCL, but not, not here at the CLS. Um, 
All of the uh, first cohort studies share some common characteristics. They're all fully re they're all based on fully representative samples of either the Great British or the UK population. Um, NCDS and ECS70, the 1958 and 1970 cohorts, are both based on one week's births. Uh, the MCS, the Millennium Cohort Study, um, is a little different um, in that it's based on um, births over a 12-month period in particular areas. But they're all, they're all very large, all started off with around about 17,000 babies. All have the aim to follow participants from birth right through to adulthood and all share a similar broad aim of seeking to basically understand how experiences and circumstances at one stage of life have an impact on um, achievements and circumstances in, in later life. All of the birth cohort studies are very multi-purpose and multidisciplinary. And as we go on to see, they cover a huge variety of topics, which I'll talk more about a little later. And importantly, they're all resources for the research and policy community. So the data from all of the studies is made freely available uh, to the researchers via the UK Data Service. And we'll um, show you exactly how to get hold of that data a little later in the webinar. So um, the cohort studies are, are hugely valuable resources, which allow researchers to examine a full, a full range of issues. Um, and this slide just kind of gives an indication of the kinds of questions which are best answered by, by cohort studies. So by following study members throughout their lives, this allows us to examine the long-term outcomes of experiences and decisions in, in early life. And, and by having regular follow-ups, um, we can also examine more short-term outcomes also. And the fact that the, the surveys are so broad in their coverage means that it's possible for us to examine the links between uh, the different uh, domains of life. Uh, many researchers use the, the life history information which we've collected over the course of these people's lives to examine how uh, trajectories across these various domains, so employment, family formation, housing, etc., are interwoven and inter interlinked. And also the fact that information has been gathered from um, multiple generations. So um, most of the studies uh, contain information which has been collected from the parents of the cohort and then the cohort members themselves. And in some cases also the children of cohort members. And we've also got some information about uh, grandparents. So that the studies can be used uh, to, they, can, they provide an opportunity to look at intergenerational, intergenerational uh, transfers of advantage and disadvantage. And also then the fact that there are these multiple cohort studies following people of different ages means that um, they provide an opportunity to examine how circumstances have changed um, and how people's experience have changed um, as, um, bet between different cohorts. So coming on to, to focus on BCS70. Um, so BCS70 began back in 1970 as the uh, British Birth Survey. So the initial focus of the study was to investigate uh, factors associated with mortality and well-being amongst uh, newborn babies and their mothers. Um, so data was collected about, um, about around about 17,000 babies that were born in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland in, in one week in 1970. So that information was collected generally by the midwives that, um, that delivered, delivered those, those babies. Um, so information was collected from the mothers and also uh, information was extracted from medical records about things like the, the birth weight of the child and any problems during uh, the pregnancy and with the delivery. And then the study subsequently be um, became a, a longitudinal study which has now tracked these individuals for the last 45 years. So the first follow-up took place in 1975 when children were age 5 and then in 1980 at age 10 and these early sweeps um, monitored educational, behavioural, emotional, social and physical development and, and sought to establish links between this and the conditions during pregnancy and birth, medical conditions and social conditions. Uh, the next follow-up took place at 16 and then subsequently the cohort has been tracked um, as they've gone on, or gone on to become adults um, and all aspects of their adult life have been um, um, have been the subject of inquiry, so forming their, forming their own families, uh, entering the world of employment and their subsequent 
employment trajectories, etc. And basically, each stage of the study has sought to collect information which is relevant to the particular stage of the life course that they were at at that time, and then to examine links between the present situation and the pathways that people have trodden in the past. So the study has collected information from a wealth of different sources over time. Um, so as I mentioned, um, initially parents were key respondents, and that was, in most cases was the mother. Um, so parents were the key respondents in, in throughout the earlier suites, although cohort members themselves did begin answering some questions from the age of five onwards. Um, and have subsequently been the, the key respondents throughout the, throughout the life of the study. At 10 and 16, we also collected information from schools. So teachers completed questionnaires about things like the behavior of the child at school and their attitude towards learning. And the, the, child, the, um, the cohort members' examination results were also obtained from schools. Over the course of the study, cohort members have set a wide variety of different kinds of tests. Um, so tests during childhood covered all different aspects of abilities, such as literacy, numeracy, reasoning, those kinds of things. At age 34, the cohorts had some uh, basic skills tests to look at um, levels of adult literacy and numeracy. And at 42, the cohort sat a vocabulary assessment, which was um, a repeat of an assessment which was administered at 16. And the forthcoming age 46 survey, which will commence next year, will also feature some cognitive assessments, which I'll, I'll say a little more about later. Uh, lots of medical information has also been collected. So throughout the childhood suites, there were a series of medical examinations um, where objective measurements of height and weight, hearing, vision, and various other um, biomeasures were uh, collected. Uh, since then, there have not been any uh, adult um, biomedical measures, um, but there will be a very uh, comprehensive set of measures included in the forthcoming age 46 survey, um, which again I'll say a little more about uh, shortly. And then finally, um, at age 34, information was also collected from um, any children that the cohort members had had, or for, for half the sample actually. And the children sat assessments which were similar to those that the cohort members themselves had sat when they were young uh, to allow us to look at how, um, how um, ability was passed from one generation to the next. And then also at age 42, sorry, um, we also uh, collected um, consent um, to link the information and the responses which people have given to the, to the surveys over the years to uh, health records and economic records held by uh, government departments. So this slide shows the numbers that have participated in each suite. Um, and so as you can see, we started off with just under 17,000 participants in the birth survey. And this has dropped off over time, um, and Tarek's going to talk a little bit more about that um, in, his, in his talk. Um, most of the surveys have involved face-to-face -face visits, um, but there have been some exceptions to that. So the, the age 26 survey, uh, which happened in, in 1996, was a postal survey, and you can see that the numbers of people participating in that particular suite uh, was, a, was a bit lower um, than had typically been the case previously. And the age 38 survey uh, took place via telephone. Um, you can see that in recent years, the amount of drop-off has, has reduced, and um, we were very pleased that at age 42, we actually interviewed more participants than we had at either 34 or uh, at 38. So this slide gives a, a very broad indication of the types of information that has been collected by BCS 70 over time. Um, it's, I mean, this is a very kind of indicative um, list of the topics. Um, there's obviously a lot more um, which has been covered, um, and all of that in, all information about the coverage of every suite, much more detailed information, is available on the website, which Brian will, will show you uh, shortly. But just to give a broad indication, so at birth, um, there was a very medical focus. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, a lot of the focus was about the conditions of the pregnancy, the birth weight of the child, and any problems at birth. But there was also information collected about uh, the circumstances of the family into which the child was born, uh, like the parental employment and income and those kinds of measures. But then 
over time, the scope of coverage has, has really broadened considerably. So uh, during the school years, information was again collected about uh, family circumstances, employment, financial circumstances, the housing situation, um, the child's health and also the parent's health, uh, the child's behaviour at school, also questions about the child's expectations about how their life uh, would pan out. The, uh, and then in, so in, in adulthood, we went on to, um, to look at the, the uh, family circumstances, employment, lots of information about income has been collected, housing, health again, cognitive ability, and lots of questions about attitudes and values as well. Um, so coming on to have a look at the age 42 survey in a little bit more detail, which is the most recent survey, it took place in 2012 when, when study members were age 42. So this was comprised of a 60-minute face-to-face interview and a 16-page paper self-completion questionnaire. Um, looking at the topics that were covered in a bit more detail, so much of the information collected was kind of uh, core content, which has, been which has been featured in all or at least most of the adult suites of BCS 70. Um, but there are also some new topics which were covered, which, um, which are indicated here in red. So um, those include a series of questions about housing costs and housing equity, which we included to get a, a better sense of, um, of total wealth. In terms of employment, there are a series of questions on the amount of health help sorry, that um, people have received from parents and others in, in getting a job and with their careers, which is potentially important in terms of um, recent debates about social mobility. In terms of education, we've never previously obtained details about the subjects of degrees which people had studied or the universities that they'd attended. And there was a strong plea from uh, researchers wanting to look at things like the economic returns of particular subjects or attending particular kinds of university, like Russell Group universities. And also we included some retrospective uh, questions about the schools which people had attended at age 16, because the age 16 survey was affected by a teacher strike which coincided with the data collection which meant that, um, for, that which meant that information about the school which cohort members were attending was missing for quite a large proportion of the cohort so this information was collected retrospectively at 42 to try and fill that in. The self-completion uh, aspect of the interview also had uh, a number of new topics which included class identity and sexuality which we'd never asked about specifically previously. We also had questions about gynecological problems for women and uh, fertility intentions and childlessness and use of infertility treatments. And then the paper self-completion questionnaire also uh, contains some new topics never previously covered uh, by BCS 70. So um, those, for example, included some uh, questions about diet, so consumption of breakfast, um, regularity of eating breakfast, regularity of eating things like ready meals and convenience foods, takeaways, um, and those kinds of things. As I mentioned, there was also um, a vocabulary assessment, um, which was part of the age 42 survey. So this was a shortened version of the test, which was administered at 16. So there were 20 items in this test rather than uh, 75, which there were in the original age 16 assessment. Um, so that will allow us to look at how vocabulary has uh, changed over time. And then, as I mentioned, um, we also collected consent to be able to link um, the responses to our survey questions to um, information which is held um, in health records and economic records. Um, we obtained this consent for both cohort members themselves, and then we also tried to collect consent from uh, co-resident partners as well. So the records which are included in these health records are, are things like hospital admissions, uh, visits to family doctors, and then rec records of specific conditions such as cancer and diabetes and prescriptions given as well. So I mean, much of this information is information that we've, we've, we've tried to obtain via questionnaires over time, but um, this is obviously based on self-reported data, so it would be really useful uh, to uh, be able to match in some actual objective, rec objective measures of these things from health records directly. Now, the linked uh, data is not yet available, um, but it's in the pipeline, and we hope that this will be available um, for use by researchers in the not-too-distant future. 
Uh, you can see that the consent rate for cohort members was pretty good at 72%, but um, not so good uh, for partners at just a third. And then similarly, um, consent was obtained to um, link uh, survey responses with economic records. So that would include information from the D held by the DWP about benefits received in employment programs and information held by the HMRC um, on earnings, uh, national insurance contributions and, and tax credits. Again, we, had, we, obtained, we sought to obtain this consent from cohort members and their partners. And Again, the, the cohort member consent rates were pretty good, a bit lower than the health consent rates, but the, the partner consent rates a bit lower. So BCS70 uh, is a very high profile study. Uh, it's very widely used by researchers and findings from the, uh, from the study are very often featured in the media. So I just wanted to give you a, a kind of flavor of some of the more recent findings which have come out from the study. Um, so just a few examples. Um, so, I mean, there's been much previous research which has established links between being born uh, prematurely and academic ability. Um, but a very recent paper which came out this year, I think, um, showed that the effect of um, poorer um, academic ability amongst um, prematurely born children, um, which was particularly uh, the case in mathematics, seemed to extend right the way through into adulthood, such that those born uh, prematurely um, were typically still earning less uh, in their mid-40s. Another recent study uh, demonstrated how childhood inactivity is strongly associated with low levels of physical activity in adulthood. So children who often took part in sport at age 10 were much more likely to participate in physical activities in their, in their early 40s. And then finally, a study published last year demonstrated the link between reading in childhood and vocabulary and mathematical ability at, at 16. And then using the vocabulary assessment administered at 42, subsequent research has also shown that the benefits of continuing to read for leisure uh, extend right the way through into adulthood. So, as I mentioned, the, the, the study is really very widely used um, by researchers, and we've um, we, we endeavour to keep a, um, a bibliography of all of the research which is based on data collected by BCS70 on our website, um, which you can access via the link on the screen. There are hundreds of publications on that list, um, which, is, um, which is searchable by, by key terms. So, I mean, if there are particular topics which are of interest to you, then, that, then a search of our bibliography is probably a good, a good place to start if you're, um, if you're planning on, on conducting a piece of research on a particular topic. And then many of the findings which are, which are um, reported um, on the study have gone on to have um, impacts, direct impacts on policy as well. Um, so in the field of, just a couple of examples of that, so within the field of mental health, um, some research that showed that half of those with mental health problems at age 26 had gone on to develop a psychiatric disorder by age 34. And so policy makers responded to this finding with a commitment to early intervention aimed at promoting better mental health and well-being. In terms of careers advice, um, then research based on BCS70 showed the significant negative um, effects of having periods outside of employment or training after leaving school, um, and, how, and showed how that there were you know, really, really very long-term negative consequences in terms of employment prospects for the future and, and mental health. And this, this research was featured in a very high-profile report. Uh, bridging the gap, which led to the creation of the connection service, providing um, careers advice for for young people, and also on, on youth policy, the government's uh, youth matters policy, which was launched in 2005, sought to improve local facilities for teenagers, and that was um, again partly based on BCS 70 evidence showing how involvement in structured leisure activities during the teenage years can have lasting benefits in terms of employment prospects and uh, income, uh, et cetera. Um, so that's been a kind of whistle-stop intro to BCS 70. There is a lot more information available on the uh, CLS website. There's the, the web address there. Um, I don't know if anyone has any uh, questions that they would like to ask at this point. If so, 
Uh, feel free to use the chat room. No. In that case, I will uh, hand over to Brian. Ah, we just had one question. Are the slides available after? Yes. Yeah, we'll make the slides available to you via the website, and there'll also be a recording of the webinar if you want to listen to me droning on <laughs> again. Um, but both will be available um, after the, the webinar, yes. Okay, I will hand over to Brian. Um, there's many more opportunities to ask questions, so if anything comes to mind, uh, feel free to add your questions to the chat room and we'll uh, do our best to answer them. Thank you very much, Matt. And as we say, uh, we'll be here till 5 o'clock, so um, by all means, come up with any questions later on in proceedings. I'm going to go on to the next uh, slide, which is uh, about accessing BCS70 from the UK data service. And this picture here in the bottom left hand corner is the <coughs> website of the UK data service, which is, we'll, we'll be going to the website in a couple of minutes. The UK data service is a wonderful repository of data funded by the ESRC to support the research, uh, the work of researchers worldwide. And it's a single point of access to a big range of surveys, including large-scale government surveys, international data, and um, longitudinal data sets that we administer and we, we deposit with the UK Data Service. And uh, so how do you actually get the data from the UK Data Service? You first of all register with the UK Data Service at that address, http ukdataservice.ac.uk. And you give details of what you're going to use the data for. So they, they want to know that you're a serious researcher who's going to um, <coughs> put the data to good use. You're not just uh, uh, idly wanting to look at what people born in 1970 are up to. Uh, and there's two types of access. The normal end user access is, is applies to almost all the data you get on BCS70. Um, for that, you have to uh, sign a um, uh, undertaking that you aren't going to try to identify any individuals. Of course, the data are anonymized anyway. They don't have anybody's names and addresses or workplace names and addresses, but you mustn't try to uh, uh, cross-tabulate a large number of variables that would leave you with only one person in each box or something like that. Um, the special license is only for sensitive disclosive data such as county of residence which sometimes gets down to quite small numbers. So uh, we're, uh, we treat confidentiality of the data very seriously and we uh, are, are careful about disclosing uh, small area uh, data like that. And the data for each sweep are downloadable separately. So there have so far been, as Matt was saying, there's been nine sweeps so far, at ages 0, 5, 10, up to 42. And you download them as separate files, and then you can uh, either put them all together into one longitudinal, very large data set, or you can just, for instance, have a project where you just get the age 10 data set and see what what's happening for a child when they're age 10, see how that predicts what their life is like by the time they're age 42. Uh, and there's a choice of formats for download. Um, you can either use SPSS format or STATA format or tab delimited format. And if we go and see what the files look like, um, most for the most of those nine sweeps, it's just a flat file where the bulk of the data is one record per case, and there's usually a separate uh, file with derived variables. And of course, um, there's plenty of derived variables with each sweep because when we interview people, we don't say to them, 
what's your social class uh, um, or your socioeconomic group. Uh, we just ask them what they do for a living, and then um, social class or socioeconomic group would be a derived variable. Um, for some sweeps, particularly some of the more recent sweeps, like the age 42 sweep, um, they may have extra files because we have done special exercises to go through various histories, like the relationship history, housing history, uh, employment history, qualifications. And we, as, as Matt was saying earlier, we've sometimes asked people to catch up on or to refresh our memory where we didn't know what it was originally about things like um, the schools they went to and so on. So um, <clears throat> you may find, that especially with the age 42 survey, that there's about eight files, including all these separate bits of information. Uh, finally, one thing that people find a little bit uh, confusing in the nomenclature is the unfolding brackets file, and that's where uh, if, if we ask people what their income is and they're, they're unable or unwilling to provide a precise amount, we sometimes ask a series of questions which defines a band in which, into which the answer uh, lies. Now, uh, I'm just going to go to a separate screen here. Where we're going to go to Internet Explorer. And we'll um, first of all go to the UK Data Service website. And you may recognize this from the slide I just showed. This is the UK Data Service website, which is the place where you go to download data, and uh, the key uh, the key data key is just here. If you press key data, then uh, you get the screen which has UK surveys, cross national surveys, longitudinal studies, and that's what we want. We're a longitudinal study, so if you click that button, you'll see here. I'm going to scroll down a little bit, rather slowly, because I think on your screen it takes a while for a scrolling down to take effect. Here's the 1970 British Cohort Study. There's also some other studies here, like the National Child Development Study, Millennium Cohort Study, LSYPE, which Matt mentioned earlier. If we click National 1970 British Cohort Study, then this is the operative bit we go to next. You either go to the normal British Cohort Study data sets, or the special license access data sets. Now, the special license one, there's only one, which is the county data. Uh, so if we went in there, then we'd need to sign a special license to get that. But for the, or the other studies, the other sweeps, there's all these data sets, um, uh, starting in 1970-72 and going right up to 2012. Uh, there's also some sub-studies in there as well, but, but, but there are nine full surveys of everybody who's in, in the study. So supposing we wanted to download the 29-year uh, follow-up, we click on that, and um, we get to the 29-year follow-up, which was 1999-2000. Uh, and it tells us um, some general details about the uh, study, some subject categories, and downloading, slow, sorry, da scrolling down slowly, there's an abstract there explaining a bit about uh, the planning of the study and what it involves. But scrolling back up again, we can uh, download or order the data by clicking here. And um, uh, I'm not going to log into the UK Data Service right now to do this, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you need to log in with uh, your own user ID to start with. And it's easy enough to get a user ID uh, for the UK Data Service because uh, uh, you just simply write to them and tell them, tell them what your research is about, and then one or two days later, you, you're given a user ID and password. And the, to download the, uh, the uh, data, you uh, put in your user ID and password, log in officially uh, as an individual member of the uh, UK data service, and then 
it, you can download it uh, to your computer. Uh, and, but what you'll find that when you download the data is that you have to sign a undertaking, uh, on, an online undertaking, to say that you won't try and uh, identify any individuals. Okay, uh, I now start dealing with uh, the um, slides for documentation. There we go. So, what documentation is available on the CLS website? Well, um, there's a wealth of documentation. Um, there's user guides. Uh, for each, each of the nine sweeps has a user guide written specially for it, which tell you the details of the survey, how the field work was organized, what kind of variables are in the survey, what were any constraints, uh, uh, making sense of the variables available, telling you the conventions that were used. Uh, and also, besides the user guides, we've got all the questionnaires are available. So both face-to-face -face and telephone questionnaires available. In the future, there will be online versions of questionnaires as well. And the good thing about the questionnaires, especially for the older surveys, the ones which were uh, on paper rather than uh, computer-assisted interviews, the names of each variable are written next to the question. Uh, so you can see in what context the question was asked, because you'll find sometimes that certain questions were only asked contingent on the, reply, on the response to a previous question. So they're rooted depending on what happens in the previous question. Um, and then there's also technical reports on sample design, the development work, the conduct of field work, coding and editing and data preparation. And um, besides uh, documentation available on the CLS website, which we'll go to in a minute, you can also explore the variables at the UK data service, um, which is the website we were looking at previously and we'll look at it again soon. Uh, Now let's go back to the sharing of the screen. And this time we'll first go to the Centre for Longitudinal Studies website. So this is our own website here at the UCL Centre for Longitudinal Studies. And um, here's where it says 1970 British Cohort Study. And what you see if you click another centre British cohort study is that you've got all of these tabs, first of all the history of the study, about the sample, published work, accessing the data which we've already dealt with. But the most interesting one is down the bottom, surveys and documentation. And here you see it's exploded up into nine different surveys. And each of these, if we click on them, so for instance this is a 1980 survey here, 10 year old, they were 10 years old at that point, and you see under 1980 we've got a possibility of looking at the questionnaires, and there, are, there were mm, about 10 questionnaires in 1980. There's the educational pack, the pictorial language comprehension test, the friendly maths test, the shortened Edinburgh reading test, medical examination form, and all these others. And each one of these you can open up um, and see what questions were asked. And uh, there's also the user guides. So there's the guide to the BTS 70 10 year data set is in two parts because in those days it was rather big and they were worried that it would be too big to download in one or whole bunch. Uh, there's also data notes which uh, provide uh, notes on um, uh, health and health behaviours in that particular case, but in, in a lot of uh, different sweeps we've written data notes on how we process the data to make certain um, derived variables available such as uh, educational best educational qualification ever recorded or something like that. Um, and then finally there's some information on derived variables at age 10. In this case, this is um, Carolock, which is a, uh, a 
derived variable about locus of control, how much you feel at age 10 that you're in control of your own achievement or is it just a matter of luck that things turn out well or can you make things happen yourself? And um, law sec was children's self-esteem. So this is just an example of some of the things that are available. And each, each of these surveys, 2016, well 2016 hasn't happened yet, but uh, 2012 we've got user guides, questionnaires, consultative conference, technical reports, data notes, and so on. And so each of these, you can go to um, the particular survey to get the uh, questionnaires or the user guides or data notes. Now, um, there's also, uh, as Matt said earlier, the publications list, uh, which um, is down at the bottom here. Publications and resources. If you are thinking of doing any um, work yourself in any particular area, go to the bibliography, which is here, and if, for instance, uh, well, well, let's first of all type in BCS 70 and see how many publications there's ever been. Uh, there's been 779 publications so far in BCS 70. Um, and these, these are, have all got hyperlinks to the uh, abstract. So if you click on that one, you should get the abstract to that particular one, Bereavement and Childhood, the Impact on Social and Educational Outcomes. Um, but if we, wanted to, if, if we wanted to search on the title or a word in the abstract, so for instance, if we wanted to look at any research that's been done on diabetes, say, in BCS 70, um, there have been 14 uh, papers on diabetes in BCS 70. So you see the, not, the word diabetes doesn't necessarily appear in the title. This one says social and economic trajectories in women's health first one here, uh, but we have fed all the abstracts into the uh, bibliographic database so that if that, word appears, if that word appears in the abstract, it'll find it. Then I'm going to take you now back to the UK data service because uh, one thing that's quite useful uh, in the UK data service is that they've got a um, uh, so to speak, a data dictionary which allows you to access online by pressing this button a version of the data. Uh, it's called Nestar, uh, and <coughs> if we if we wanted to check what kind of variables we can see in the 29-year data, um, we can see that the we click variable description and it, it breaks it down into all the different sections that were in that survey. Uh, there's the um, uh, employment section so we can see what was their own job, their, their current main activity, the reasons for not working and so on. There's the uh, health section which has got breathing and chest problems, mental health and so on, smoking and drinking, diet and exercise. We can see for instance how many cigarettes people smoke daily. And the good thing is that it gives you a frequency count of exactly how many cigarettes everybody smokes. And so by, by going through the categories of um, different parts of the questionnaire, you eventually get to an individual variable. And of course, there's usually about over a thousand variables at each survey, sometimes as many as about 4,000 variables. And so each one of those, you can get the frequency count. So we see that 26% um, of people said they smoked 20 cigarettes a day, 17% said 15, 23% said about 10, and so on. Um, and you can even uh, find out things like, um, um, if you look in the citizenship and values section, we can see whether uh, which party you voted for in the last election. So, uh, of course, it was, this was 1999-2000, so Tony Blair had just won a landslide victory. So 56% of people said they voted Labour. Of course, this is not a 
representative sample of everybody of every age. They're all a, they were all aged 29 at that point, uh, and so uh, probably slightly more likely to vote Labour than Conservative compared with older people. And so it's quite useful to be able to um, do uh, to explore for the variables that you might want for your research. Uh, and you can get a frequency count like that. If, you've, if you're logged in as a uh, uh, member, then you can, do, you can do a tabulation where you tabulate uh, one of the variables against the other. Uh, so you can, you can cross-tabulate to by clicking here. Um, and so I'm now going to go back to uh, the Center for Longitudinal Studies website. One more thing that um, I wanted to say was that uh, there's going to be uh, a thing called the Unified Search Platform, uh, which is going to be tested pretty soon in the next few months, uh, and which is like a very, very sophisticated data dictionary not only covering all the um, data sets that we administer here at Center for Longitudinal Studies, but it also would uh, encompass other comparable longitudinal data sets like um, uh, ELSA, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. And we'll, uh, if you check into the CLS website, we'll be able to let you know when that uh, Unified search platform is available. Okay, I'm going to finish there for now, and um, uh, then uh, uh, are, are there any questions? Um, uh, the one question here uh, is from Bazena, who says, the most recent counted data on specialized selection is from 2000. Do you plan to update this file by more recent geographical information? I don't think we've got any plans at the moment to update that. Um, uh, if we publish using VCS or NCDS data, do CLS automatically pick up our publications, or do we need to notify you? Well, that's a good question, because um, we do try and pick them up from Google Scholar by typing in BCS70 or NCDS as a keyword, but that doesn't always pick up every publication. So we are very grateful if people do notify us. Uh, we're fairly confident that we've picked up you know, at least 90% of all the publications that people have, have come up with, but we always worry that we've missed out on some because these Google Scholar searches don't always get everything. Um, what is the email address for this? Uh, the email address is um, uh, feedback at cls.ac.uk. Sorry, the feedback at cls.ioe.ac.uk. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, any more questions? Okay, in that case, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Tariq Mustafa, who's going to talk about uh, response and attrition. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Tariq Mustafa, and I'm a researcher at uh, CLS, and I'm mainly working on quantitative methodology and uh, uh, survey response. Uh, so my presentation will focus on attrition in uh, BCS70 and uh, we'll, we'll see um, what we can do about it. Uh, so as you know, BCS70 follows the lives of 17,000 people born in a single week in 1970 and these people have been surveyed at different points uh, in time. And as you, uh, you might expect, in a longitudinal survey, some respondents would participate in a number of uh, ways, then drop out from the study and will have uh, gaps in the uh, data. So uh, first, uh, the BCS70 sample was identified through a collaboration between uh, the study team and the NHS. 
So uh, the babies were identified in hospitals and maternity units in uh, Great Britain, so England, Scotland, and Wales. And uh, the sample was born in a, in a single week in 1970. And this fact means that uh, this sample is uh, random and is representative of um, uh, all babies born in the UK in this particular year. Uh, we don't have oversampling in uh, BCS70 and therefore we have only a small number of uh, ethnic minorities and uh, uh, well, ethnic minorities and uh, in BCS70 the sample was supplemented by immigrants uh, who uh, were born outside of uh, the UK but who have moved to uh, Great Britain and were born in the same week in 1970 and thus were eligible to uh, be part of the sample. So far, uh, weights have not been constructed and provided as uh, part of the data sets we publish. However, these can be constructed by the researchers as uh, we will see. First, what is attrition? Uh, the definition is, attrition is the discontinued participation of some individuals in a longitudinal survey for reasons that are unknown or beyond the control of the researcher. Uh, we need to distinguish between two types of uh, response. First, we have unit non-response. This is the case where a respondent has been uh, selected to participate in the study but did not uh, take part in the survey. So we have completely missing record for this respondent. The other case is item non-response and this is uh, the case where a respondent has participated in the survey but did not answer all questions. So we, we have uh, gaps in the information they have provided. Uh, for unit non-response, uh, we have multiple reasons. For instance, uh, it could be non-contact. This is the case where uh, the survey agency was unable to establish contact with the respondent because uh, the respondent is living in a gated community or has um, uh, works in does night shifts or so on. Um, Another reason is refusal. This is the case where the respondent has refused to participate in the study. Uh, we also have inability. This is the case where uh, respondents are unable to participate in the survey for uh, whichever reason. So it could be um, uh, health issues or uh, disability or whatever. Uh, in the case of longitudinal studies, we know that non-response is increasing and it's a fact of life actually in longitudinal studies so at some point uh, respondents will start dropping out and the sample will uh, decrease over time. However, non-response is not always permanent which means that some respondents would drop out from the study, uh, would participate in the study, drop out and then participate again so they have interrupted response patterns. So in this table you can see uh, the number of respondents who have participated in BCS70. So in sweep one here uh, you have uh, 16,569 individuals and you can see that the number is declining over time. Although at some points it has uh, increased. So between sweep two and uh, three, between uh, sweeps five and six and between sweeps eight and nine. You can also see the breakdown of a number uh, response. So you can see that a number of respondents have died. The, the largest increase was in wave um, two. So this is basically uh, infant mortality. Uh, you can see that some respondents ha are permanent immigrants. So they have left the country and, not par and did not uh, take part in any further surveys. And of course, we, don't, we do not follow uh, respondents uh, abroad. We have temporary immigrants, so these are respondents who have left the country and then came uh, back. And of course, we have refusals, so these are respondents who have uh, refused to participate in the study. But uh, fortunately, in some cases, we have managed to uh, revert this uh, uh, the refusal. Um, so this is what happens to the BTS 70 sample. So it started at 96%, so this is in the first sweep, and the number started declining. However, this decline was not always permanent. So between sweep 2 and 3, it has increased again, sweep 5 and 6, and sweep 8 and uh, 9. Uh, so in sweep 9, we have 54% of uh, the entire sample which have uh, participated in the survey. And it's also worth noting uh, that uh, the largest decline was in between sweep 4 and 5, 
So in sweep four, the respondents were age 16, and in sweep five, they were uh, they were uh, 26. So the gap between the two sweeps is 10 years, so it's relatively long. And in sweep four, it was a face-to-face -face survey. In sweep five, it was a postal survey, which is usually less reliable than face-to-face. Um, and of course, we had a change in the responsibility of responding to the survey. So in sweep four, it was the parents deciding on behalf of the uh, cohort members who were 16. But in sweep five, the cohort members were 26 and uh, had to decide for themselves whether to participate or not in the survey. Uh, in these two tables, you can see uh, the possible patterns of response that we might have. So. Uh, we have three distinct patterns, so participated in all sweeps. This is, this is the number of uh, respondents who have uh, participated in every single wave of data collection, and they represent 20% of the data. Uh, while a monotone response is the case of respondents who have participated in a number of uh, waves and then dropped out without ever coming back, and non-monotone response is the uh, case of respondents who have participated in a number of sweeps and dropped out, then dropped out and then came back again and uh, rejoined the study. So here actually is an example of the, par uh, the patterns you might uh, find in uh, BCS70. Uh, so the first one is the case where a respondent has participated in all surveys. So one stands for participation and zero is for non-response. Uh, in this case, you can see a respondent who has participated in four sweeps, dropped out in the fifth, and then participated in the remaining four. So, the impact of attrition. Basically, attrition affects a survey in uh, a longitudinal survey in two different ways. So, first, it might uh, cause uh, bias in sample composition because we are likely to lose individuals from particular. Uh, socio-demographic groups, such as um, men, uh, those from socially disadvantaged groups, uh, uh, those from ethnic mi minorities, uh, those who are mobile and more, li more likely to change uh, uh, homes, um, uh, those who work for long working hours and are hard to reach, and so on. Uh, Attrition also leads to uh, a decline in uh, sample size and to fewer transitions and incomplete histories in the case of longitudinal studies and to reduce statistical uh, power. So ways to detect attrition in uh, a longitudinal survey. So you can do basically two uh, types of uh, analysis. First, you can compare the characteristics of your sample in any sweep to the, sample, to the same characteristics at birth because the sample at birth was uh, complete, almost complete. So you can see how these characteristics evolve. So you can see whether the percentage of men is declining or uh, disadvantaged groups or on, I mean, based on whichever variable of, uh, you are interested in. And of course, you can use binary regression models like logit or probit models where the outcome variable is, um, or the dependent variable is response to the survey. It takes the value of one if the, um, uh, if the respondent participated and the zero otherwise, and the independent variables could be any of the characteristics of the respondents. And if these characteristics are highly correlated with the likelihood of responding to the survey, then in this case you can conclude that uh, attrition is, um, is leading to uh, sample bias. So what happens to uh, the BCS70 sample over time? So here you can see uh, a graph uh, of the sample evolution based on a number of characteristics. So you can see that the number of uh, respondents born to single mothers in 1970 is declining. Uh, the number of respondents born to mothers who are living in London at birth is also declining. And the number of respondents born in, fa in larger families is, uh, has also declined. Uh, we also can see that the number of men has declined over time. Uh, mainly to uh, non-response uh, and also to uh, death because men are likely to uh, um, are more likely to die actually at different uh, at, uh, especially at birth and at age uh, around age 18. Um, the number of uh, uh, respondents who were born to uh, mothers with low levels of education has declined, and the number of uh, 
response born to fathers uh, with uh, from lower social class is, has also declined. So in general, you can see that uh, the sample is losing uh, socially disadvantaged uh, group, and this, all, of course, would lead to a bias in the sample composition. So how to deal uh, with attrition? There are three ways of uh, dealing uh, with attrition. Uh, use of attrition weights use of multiple imputation techniques and use of full information maximum uh, likelihood techniques. So far, we have not produced um, any uh, attrition weights uh, in BCS 70 However, these can be constructed uh, by the researcher and can be adapted to the uh, research question they are uh, trying to answer. So. Uh, these models are based on uh, logistic regressions where the outcome variable is uh, response to the survey. It takes the value of 1 if the respondent participated in the study and 0 otherwise. And the independent variables could include a variety of respondent uh, characteristics. Uh, usually we choose characteristics at, at birth because uh, they are uh, non-missing and available for almost all respondents. Uh, the non-response weights or the attrition weights in, are equal to the inverse of the probability of responding uh, to the survey. So after compute, after estimating these uh, logistic regressions, you would compute uh, the probability of responding to the survey and the weight would be the inverse, so 1 divided by uh, this probability. Uh, so this is basically it. Here you have uh, a number of references which might help you when uh, working with uh, BCS70 data. And uh, I am happy to answer any, uh, any questions. So thank you. No questions so far. Yeah. Any questions or? Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so um, hello, this is uh, Matt again. I've um, come back to tell you um, a little about uh, what's new and upcoming uh, for BCS 70. Um, so I'm going to do the first part of this um, presentation and then pass over to Brian. Um, so, uh, what are our future plans? Well, the, um, the current plan is that future sweeps of the study will take place at four-year intervals. So, the last sweep took place at age 42, um, and our next uh, sweep will take place at 46, which will begin next year. Uh, so, plans are well underway for that. And, um, and then the sweep after that will take place in 2020 when the cohort members will be aged 50. Um, and this will match the same um, pattern which has been followed um, in the NCDS as well. And so after age 50, NCDS switched to five-year intervals. So um, last year, no, the year before, sorry, we conducted the age 55 survey. We'll, on BCS 70, also be switching to five-year intervals so that we can match NCDS and maximize the potential for cross-cohort comparisons. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about the um, age 46 survey, uh, or the 2016 to 17 survey. Um, so this survey will be a bit different to um, most of the adult surveys um, which have taken place so far in that it will have a, a particular focus on health. Um, although it will also cover many of the, um, the core aspects um, of other, other people, the, the other aspects of people's lives in quite, in quite some detail as well, but we will have a particular focus on health. Um, and the survey will aim to, to gather information which will allow us to assess the longitudinal predictors of health in, in midlife. Um, it's planned also um, that many of the measures which will be included this time around will be um, repeated in the future. And so this will allow us to use the measurements collected this time as a baseline against which we can measure uh, subsequent changes which occur as the cohort age. Um, so conducting a, a survey with a biomedical focus at the age of, of 46 is, is important um, in that 
it allows us to measure uh, risk factors associated with poor health at an age uh, which is prior to, for most people, um, disease and uh, you know, significant diseases and functional decline setting in. And additionally, a very similar biomedical follow-up took place with the NCDS 1958 cohort when they were a very similar age. So um, this will allow us to, um, to, to look at um, comparisons between the two cohorts in terms of health in, uh, in the mid-40s. So the, um, the biomedical survey uh, will take um, the form of a 90-minute nurse visit, which will include 45 minutes of interviewing and 45 minutes of biomeasures, and then there'll be a paper self-completion questionnaire in addition to that. So in terms, of what the, in terms of the planned measurements, what we're looking to do is collect blood samples, which we've never done previously for um, BCS70. Um, and then from the blood samples, we will be planning to extract DNA and also perform a range of other analyses. So um, immediate plans are in place to analyze uh, levels of cholesterol and um, HbA1c, which is uh, associated with um, risk of diabetes. Um, and then after that, after those analyses have been conducted, there will be blood. There will be you know plenty of blood left over for um, for, ma for many more analyses to take place in the future. We'll also be taking measurements of blood pressure. Um, the cohort members will be asked to do a diet, um, an online diet questionnaire on which will, um, it's basically an inventory of all that they ate on uh, two days in the seven days which will follow their visit, um, which they'll be asked to complete on online. We'll be doing a series of cognitive assessments um, which have also been conducted with the NCDS cohort, which will focus on uh, memory, on um, executive function, on um, attention to detail and um, perception. Um, so these are assessments which have not been conducted with the BCS70 cohort before, but they have been widely used on other studies, so it will allow us to, to look at, make comparisons between people born in 1970 and people born at other times. Um, we'll be doing some measures of functional uh, performance, so that will, those will include grip strength and uh, standing balance. We'll be taking, um, and very importantly, taking objective measures of height, weight, and body fat, and waist and hip circumference. So height and weight and waist and hip circumference have been measured uh, directly during childhood, but uh, since then um, we've been relying on self-reported height and weight, uh, which we know is um, sometimes not entirely accurate. So um, very important to include objective measures of those this time around. There will be quite a significant focus on mental health and well-being, which will be administered using a series of different um, questionnaire uh, scales. Um, general health, lifestyle factors. Um, we will also be asking the cohort to wear um, an activity monitor or an accelerometer for the seven days after their nurse visit. Um, the kind of activity monitor that we'll be asking people to wear um, is a device which is um, attached to the thigh. Um, and it's what, what the device is particularly good at is being able to distinguish between um, sitting down, lying down, standing up, and then moving around. So we'll be able to get a real good sense of just how active, or more importantly, how inactive um, the, uh, the cohort members are in their mid-40s. We know that physical, acti physical inactivity is a significant uh, risk factor for cardiovascular disease and other health problems in later life. And um, evidence from the, from the age 42 survey showed that um, inactivity was uh, was rife amongst the 1970 cohort, with around about a third of people basically saying that they do no exercise at all. Um, we also have a funding application in uh, to include a hearing assessment, so we're hopeful that hearing will be able to be measured as well, but that's not 100% as yet, so we'll find out soon on that. In terms of the timetable for the um, age 46, or 2016 survey, so we have a pre-pilot currently in the field, which is measured, which is focused primarily on the activity monitoring that I was talking about before, because that's a very new 
um, element of data collection, which we've not done on BCS 70 before, and this particular device hasn't been used on any of the other cohorts here either. So we're we're looking at the uh, the feasibility of including that at the moment and how we can maximise compliance rates, etc. Then there'll be a full dress rehearsal in January and February next year with a subsample of the cohort where all of the measures will be uh, tested and the question as to. And then the main stage of data collection is due to commence in July 2016. And because we're going to be using nurses this time, um, of which there aren't so many as there are standard interviewers, it's going to be quite a long fieldwork period. So um, fieldwork's going to run until, until the end of December 2017, meaning the data will be available um, for researchers, hopefully, uh, around late 2018. Okay, I'm going to pass back to Brian now, um, who's going to tell you about some new uh, developments in terms of the data which is available. Thanks, Matt. Uh, one thing, uh, of course, about the biomedical survey is that uh, it will be, when we were looking earlier about which of the special license access data sets, that will probably be, or certainly part of it will be special license access, I think. Um, whereas most of the B seventy data is just the end user license. Now, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, newly available B seventy data. Uh, <coughs> these are data deposits that uh, are going to be available within the next few months. Uh, and there's also one which was deposited a couple of years ago, which we want to tell you about. Uh, First one is the uh, four different types of age 16 data, uh, the matrices test, the shortened Edinburgh reading test, the JIGCAL occupational interests questionnaire, and school type at age 16. And you may be asking the question, well, the age 16 data is from 19, 1986, uh, so why is it only just becoming available now? And the reason for this is that in the 20th century or before the 1999-2000 survey, all the questionnaires were paper questionnaires, were filled out on paper and had to be transcribed. And um, <clears throat> we at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies inherited all the data for BCS 70 from the Institute of, so the International Child uh, Centre, the International Centre for Child Studies in Bristol, uh, which was uh, run at the time by Professor Neville Butler, who initiated this survey in 1970. And um, uh, strangely enough, uh, we, we haven't had time, we haven't had the money uh, to. Uh, do the keying in of a certain amount of the paper questionnaires that we uh, inherited from the ICCS back then. And uh, money has only just become available to key these in, collate them, and make sense of the data, and document it properly. So I'm going to deal with these one by one. The first one is the matrices test, which looks a bit like this. Uh, people at age 16 were asked to look at this pattern of matrices and say which of these five uh, items on the right belong in this blank box. And similarly, which of these five items on the right belong in this blank box. It gets more complicated than that. It looks fairly easy to start with, but that's just the first two. Uh, and it, that, that was invented by the British Ability Scale organization. Um, so that will soon, the results of the matrices test will be soon available. Then there's the age 16 shortened Edinburgh reading test. You may remember from what I was showing before age 10 that there was a, an ERT Edinburgh reading test at age 10. There was also one at age 16 which was uh, more complicated. And that consists of um, uh, five sections. One is skimming a certain amount of text and then being tested on how much you understood of it. The second is vocabulary, uh, certain words just uh, giving you a list of words which may possibly mean the same as one word and you have to bring which is the, the one that means more or less the same. 
Then section C is a basic comprehension where you're given a story and ask questions afterwards about how much you can remember of that story. Section D is points of view where you're given five different points of view from different sort of people and you're then asked which of those five people would be likely to say this. And finally there's a section E comprehension uh, which is uh, a bit like section C only more complicated, a more, a more complicated story. And the, uh, there were 3,227 teenagers who completed the test. It's slightly low, it's a slightly disappointing response because uh, uh, as Matt was saying earlier, there was a teacher's industrial action in 1986 against the government's proposed education reforms. So that's why there was a small response to that. Um, but the next piece of um, age 16 data that's going to be available soon is the age 16 JIGCAL Occupational Interest Questionnaire. And JIGCAL stands for Job Ideas and Information Generator Computer Assisted Learning. And the 16 year old was asked to make 60 different preference choices between pairs of occupational activities like this, which, would you, which of these two would you prefer to do? Smart and repair cameras or identify chemicals in samples of soil? And um, uh, of course, you're even at the start uh, asked to say what kind of jobs you think you're more likely to be in the market for, either jobs that don't require any qualifications or jobs that require a few GCSEs or jobs that require high GCSEs or possibly A-levels or alternatively jobs that require a degree. And so there were different alternative sets of 60 preference choices depending on what you wrote for how many qualifications you reckoned you'd be getting. And so there are a tremendous scope of different jobs like organize play activities for disturbed children, analyze the fat content of milk samples, tune racing car engines, create pictures for advertisements, keep accounts and give out money at a bank, all of these kind of things. So uh, it's a, a very uh, comprehensive way of getting a sense of what kind of job market you might be in the market for when you leave school. And the answers were processed to assess which of these six occupational areas the person is best suited to? Is it scientific or practical work, or working with living things, or business commerce, artistic leanings, or caring for people, or communication activities? And of course, once that becomes available in a month or two from now, you'll be able to use that data to see what happened to the person eventually by the age of 42, did they end up in a job which was in that sort of category or not? And if they weren't in that category, is that, well, what is the reason for them not being in that category? Okay, uh, then the next um, data deposit which is going to be available pretty soon is school type at age 16. Matt has already talked quite a bit about this. Uh, because of the teachers' industrial action, um, we send out. A, although we sent out a head teacher questionnaire, it wasn't returned for 60% of cases, and so we only found out for 40% of cases back in 1986 which school, what type of school they were at. Uh, but now that missing info has has now been filled in. Um, partly from people's recall at the age 42 survey. Um, uh, and where they were asked to recall the school type and also whether it was single sex or not or whether it was a faith school or not or a boarding school or not. And we also filled in any remaining gaps by reference to historical administrative data. That's school census which became a, uh, a basis for the National Pupil Database. And this is a graph showing 
the results of the school type at age 16. As you might expect, most people went to a comprehensive school, 78% of people. Um, about 4% of people were still going to grammar school, 9% um, secondary modern school, and about 6% an independent or private school. And the, the other categories were technical, LEA, special school, independent special school, overseas or Scottish local education authority. And there's already been um, one headline finding resulting from that, um, which was Sullivan Parsons et al, um, showing that the influence of your social origins, especially parental education, remains when controlling for cognitive measures and school attainment. And uh, attending a private school is powerfully predictive of gaining a university degree, especially a degree from a Russell Group University, one of the 20 odd universities in the Russell Group. Um, grammar schooling does not appear to confer any advantage according to that research. And then finally, I'm just look draw your attention to uh, a data deposit which is already there. You can use this data right now. Uh, it's uh, the age 10 special needs data set, which is a sub-study. It's just 456 selected subjects at age 10. And it was a sub-study which was undertaken for those assessed as having moderate or severe learning disabilities and all those who came in the bottom 5% of the results in the age 10 cognitive test. So they were given the cognitive test if they were prepared to do them. And if they came in the bottom 5%, they were given these special educational tests, which were the fundamental concepts test, the copying designs test, human figure drawing test, Thackeray reading resonance, reading readiness profiles, and the Young's group mathematics test. The fundamental concepts test is for to try and get some variation in the results between people whose um, uh, whose ability is limited, and so it was things like showing them various, count, various colored counters, either circular or square or diamond shaped, and asking them to identify how many of each of the shapes there were, what, what kind of shapes could be made from, what kind of patterns could be made from those shapes, that kind of thing. The copying designs test is just showing how much you can copy a fairly simple design, like a, a circle with a square inside it and a cross or something like that. Um, human figure drawing test is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, it's can you draw a human a stick figure with two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, or do you happen to draw it in profile or not if you're not prompted? Macro reading residence profiles is if you haven't got the ability to read, are you at least able to identify certain things like cup? Uh, plate, and so on. And Young's group mathematics test is a similar, very simple mathematics test. So that uh, special needs data set is available, but it's just for 456 selected subjects. Now we're going to take questions. Uh, this, this is the last slide of the whole day. So by all means, we're going to stay here for a little bit longer. So by all means, send us some questions in. Uh, uh, if you have any, but I'd like to draw your attention to this particular uh, URL. If you've got time, we appreciate it if you'd fill in this short web survey to provide us a bit of feedback on the webinar, say which bits of it you thought were useful uh, and which bits could be improved. HTTPS www.surveymonkey.com slash r slash BCS70 webinar. Now, have we got any questions for any of the participants today? We're all sitting here still in the room. It looks like we'll be finishing earlier than scheduled. In theory, we can stay here till far. I've got some questions. Oh, good. Yeah. 
Oh, so, yeah. so the first question um, from ABC. Uh, what is the breakdown of respondents in the different UK nations? Are the sample sizes sufficient to do analyses for just one country, e.g. Scotland, or comparisons between countries? Um, well, the, 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 the sample size is evenly spread throughout the, the whole uh, of uh, Great Britain, so the, uh, there isn't any evidence that the attrition is uh, appreciably higher in Scotland or Wales than it is in England. So you'd expect, given the population of Scotland is about five million. Well, in the, so in the most recent survey at age 42, um, it's, it's the case that there are roughly, um, I think it's the case that there's roughly a thousand participants in Scotland, around about 500 participants in Wales, and then the remaining 8,000 or so um, were based in England. So the sample sizes are much smaller for Wales and Scotland, but based on the fact that there are much fewer people living in Wales and Scotland. So, but those sample sizes mean that yes, they, if the sample sizes are sufficient to do country level analyses. Once you start getting down to, you know, a more precise geographical um, analysis, then you've kind of you know, you might run into into issues with sample sizes. Question for Terry. Which missing data is most advisable? FIML, MI, or IPW? Uh, so basically, um, uh, attrition weights have been used traditionally to deal with, with non-response in uh, longitudinal surveys. However, you might want to investigate uh, multiple imputations. So there is a paper in the reference list that we have uh, that I've presented, which deals with uh, both actually and compares weights against uh, multiple imputations. Uh, so depending on your research question, you might um, want to explore one one of the uh, one of the other. Uh, however, in both cases, you need to have uh, variables which are which predict non-response and are correlated uh, with the likelihood of responding to the survey. So we've got a question from Alex. Um, I'd like to know whether the university qualification data captured differentiates between undergraduate and postgraduate qualifications. So um, in terms of, so yes, we do know about the level of postgraduate qualifications obtained, um, but the information that we were talking about in terms of the subjects studied and the uh, institution which these qualifications were obtained at is only has only been captured. Um, for first degrees, so not for postgraduate qualifications. Um, someone else has asked whether the slides will be available. Yes, we'll, um, we can send copies of the slides to, to all of the participants and we'll make a, um, the recording of the webinar available on the, on the website as well. Is it possible to link the data to the national census? No, not really, except that uh, um, you might be able to link geographically to census small area statistics, but uh, you can't actually link at an individual level to the data that people put at, uh, their, for their census return. Okay, are there any more questions? Yes, we've got one. Could it be linked to education data to find secondary degrees or other study? Um, well, we do ask people if they've done another degree. We do ask people if they've done another degree after their first one. So uh, at each, I mean, you'd normally expect most people to have done their degrees in their, in their early 20s, but we keep asking people at each survey, even at age 42, if they've done any more courses since they were last interviewed. And in the derived variables file at each survey, um, that's at age 42, 38, 34, 30, and so on. Uh, in the derived variables file, which accompanies the flat file, you will see uh, a running uh, derived variable showing what, how many uh, qualifications you've got by this time in your life. But in terms of actually linking with education data, no, we haven't. We haven't as yet collected consent from cohort members to link to education data. 
When will the unified search platform be released? Well, it's going to be beta tested, I understand, in uh, between now and Christmas, so that's the plan, but I'm not sure. And the beta testing may be for a restricted uh, number of invited participants, um, but it shouldn't be more than a few months. Okay, a question from uh, Karina regarding Northern Ireland. Um, yes, apologies, I don't think we made this particularly clear in, in my presentation earlier. So, uh, babies that were born in Northern, I Northern Ireland were included in the birth survey only. Uh, since then, there were no uh, further follow-ups of um, those born in Northern Ireland unless they moved uh, to Great Britain. Uh, can we contact you if we have further questions that arise? Yes, of course. Um, you can use the uh, same email address um, to ask any questions about, um, about the study. So that was clsfeedback at ioe.ac.uk. At what level is data on geographic location recorded? So um, that there, it varies a little from sweep to sweep. Um, so all of the data sets will have the country, um, the country variable. Um, We've also got region at every sweep. region is available at every sweep. But county, but county is, is available in that special access data set because it's a lower level than region, uh, but it's not possible to look at a final levels of detail than that, really. Okay, I think we've answered all of the questions which have come through so far. Um, I can find the link for the NCDS webinar on the CLS website, but not the slides. Uh, yet we, we haven't yet put up the slides. We will do, and we will send everyone who has registered an email um, letting you know where the, where the slides are. We've got one question here saying, do you have any courses on linking the BCS70 to other data sets? Now, of course, linking, because it's different individuals, the BCS70 data can't actually be linked on an individual record basis to NCDS data. But um, there have been people who have done cross-cohort comparisons where they've, they've done a certain uh, analysis using BC70 data and then done the same analysis using uh, looking at NCDS participants when they were the same age. Yeah, many people do that by creating one data set um, and then having a, you know, using, having, creating a, a dummy variable identifying whether that, um, whether an individual is a member of BCS70 or NCDS. Um, did you measure parental beliefs about the variables measured in the sweeps up to 16 and then after when participants had their own children? Um, Are you talking about beliefs to do with what future they had, they, they anticipated for their children or are we talking about religious beliefs or uh, attitudes? Yeah, I'm not, not quite sure what you're getting at with that question. If you want to provide a bit more clarification, we'll try and answer that. Attitudes. Attitudes, okay. Uh, so, yes, we, we did ask uh, uh, at um, either age 10 or 16 in BCS 70 what you anticipated was going to happen to your child, whether they would go to university or not, uh, that kind of thing. And so it's possible to see how much that belief was borne out by what happened later. Okay, are there any last questions before we wrap up? Okay, I think we'll stop there then. I mean, as I said, you, you can feel free to use the email address um, to ask any further questions which come to your mind there afterwards. There might be one more question for Laura. Just ah. Right oh, no, same, thanks. All right, okay. Thank you.
Uh, so, uh, okay, well, thank you for listening. Um, if I could just uh, put in one more final plea for you to complete the, uh, the web survey, if at all possible. This is the first webinar that we've done for BCS 70, so we're fairly new to the world of webinars. So any um, feedback that you have would be much appreciated, and we, we will endeavor to uh, take it on board when putting together future webinars like this. So, um, yeah, thank you for listening. Goodbye. Thank you very much.